All right, so we'll get started. Hi, I'm Ed from Animal Adventures. Thanks for having us back uh, again this week. Last week, if you did not get a chance to check out the video, we um, talked about Africa. And Africa is one of my favorite places to talk about because there, I have uh, friends scattered throughout Africa, people I, I talk to uh, regularly on the WhatsApp uh, and other uh, means of social media um, and, and meet with some of them uh, once to twice a year. So last week, if you didn't get a chance to check it out, um, I think you'd like it. There's some good information that I get right from people that live in Africa, things that they're dealing with, with uh, black market and poaching and logging and all. all we covered a, uh, a wide uh, uh, a variety of subjects last week. So if you didn't get a chance to check that out, I know uh, the people here at UMass uh, Boston are working very hard to get students engaged and to give them things to do. I promise. This is better than playing video games, at least for like one hour it is. So today we're going to talk about North America. North America is also, every place is awesome to talk about, but North America is uh, awesome because we live here in North America. And we have a lot of gems um, right in our own backyard, really, that we can see and a lot of people aren't aware of it. A lot of people want to take safaris, which I think people should go to Africa, go to other places and check it out. But, uh, you know, we have some pretty cool things right here. So this time of year with this, um, you know, virus going on and everybody in lockdown, there's a lot of families out hiking and discovering things for the first time. So once this thing lifts, which should be soon, and, uh, you know, um, hopefully people will have realized how awesome walking with their family and hiking and doing some of these outdoor things are, and we'll continue to do that. But um, enough of that. Let's see some cool thing now people make fun of me for many reasons but one one reason in particular is my obsession with turtles <clears throat> this here is a little spotted turtle and um this guy doesn't have an official name yet my kids keep uh, arguing over names so we'll settle in on something now this uh turtle is on the protected list in some areas some areas it, it uh, is listed as very vulnerable and other areas it's uh, plentiful uh, this one here was in captivity and cannot be released to the wild. So uh, we'll be keeping this little guy uh, uh, for his whole life, which could be 75 years or maybe even more. I'm not really sure how old he is right now. Um, spotted turtles don't get much bigger than this. It's a fairly small turtle. You can see right here in the palm of my hand. And th these guys are neat because they'll, they'll be uh, found in like uh, slow running water, woodlands, uh, swamp area. I grew up in Wilmington, Massachusetts, even though I did spend a bunch of time in Florida. Um, in Wilmington, where I grew up, there was these little swamps with these, you know, quagmires that you could step on and sink in, and uh, spotted turtles used to uh, love that kind of habitat. So they'll eat things like bugs and fish, and uh, tadpoles seem to be a favorite, and they will eat some vegetation as well, but they're just really uh, beautiful uh, little turtles. And these are things that you can find if you're out hiking, um, and there's some, you know, low, uh, slow running water and uh, swamp type land. These are one of the thing, turtles that you could discover. Uh, you know, you can just take some pictures of them and, and enjoy how beautiful. Like most turtles, but not all turtles, if they get scared, they can poke their head all the way in the shell like that and hide way inside there. So that's a little spotted turtle uh, found right here in New England. And uh, this is a really beautiful, cool little turtle. Okay, let's see another. We're gonna do three turtles to start. Hopefully that's not too much turtles. Of course, in my world, there's no such thing as too much turtles. Um, this guy here, really, uh, really cool. This is a diamondback terrapin. Some people will call them Maryland terrapins because you can find them in Maryland, but for uh, the students that get a chance to go to the Cape, this is where you can find this turtle in the wild. You can find this diamondback terrapin uh, at, right down the Cape. So um, if you're there and you're you know, out on the beach and you're getting bored of sitting around the beach, you can explore some uh, rock area, shallow water, and especially inlets. The inlets are a great place uh, to find wildlife. And of course you should leave it there, uh, but it's a great place to discover it. This one here, somebody had um, illegally and was uh, taken by Fish and Wildlife and then given to us uh, because they know I love turtles too. And the neat thing about these, you can see how webbed the back feet are, very webbed, but then still have um, 
you know, a, a long claw so they can grip the, the sand and walk on the sand as well. And um, I wish you could touch them. The skin is very, very soft on these turtles. And even the front feet have a nice webbing. And then with the shell being pretty much uh, shaped like a, a, like a disc, they can cut through the water fairly well. So it is a heavy shell turtle. And um, even with this you know, heavy shell, it still cuts through the water pretty well. I have a friend that uh, does a lot of uh, marine biology research and he goes spend you know, probably a month each year down the Cape and he finds these turtles. There's a few little inlets that he knows. He doesn't you know, take them or anything. He just goes and kind of studies them and watches them eat shrimp and uh, little fish and crustaceans, little snails and things like that. And then they'll eat vegetation as well. So this uh, turtle um, needs brackish water. So if you were to have one as a pet, there are some states where, you could, where people breed these and you can buy them, they're bred in captivity and you can have them as pets. They don't get much bigger than this, and, but they, there's a turtle that you'd need to add a little bit of the ocean salt uh, to and just have the water uh, brackish. Okay. I hope some of you students think this turtle's as cool as I think it is. So these two turtles you saw, are uh, small, easy to care for, the spotted turtle, the diamondback terrapin. Now we'll go to another turtle that this one here is found in the Midwest and in uh, the Southern states. And his name is Beaker. And he uh, was uh, in the wild in Florida. And if you look at his uh, shell, it kind of is deformed this way, kind of goes off, and it's a little bit deformed this way. And if Chris, you can get a shot of his nose, his nose kind of hooks to the left. And uh, I guess he was hit by a car as a young turtle, and he was at a sanctuary in Florida that was uh, redoing some things, or had some things going on. They uh, had to place a lot of their animals, and I got this guy uh, here. So, um, really a cool uh, turtle. This is an alligator snapping turtle. Now, this one will get much bigger than the snapping turtles we find around here. The common snapper that we have around here in Massachusetts and anywhere in New England um, can reach a maximum weight of 78 pounds. That's the world record. I know in the water they look much bigger, but that in fact is the world record is about 78 uh, pounds. Uh, these guys have been recorded at 200 pounds and you know, not many of them reach that size, but I've had uh, several that were over a hundred pounds. So they get quite big. This one here is about 40 pounds. Um, there's plenty of trouble on them, which I'll show you in a minute. And these guys aren't found out of the water really too, too much. This one was out of the water, must have been, it's very rare for the males to be out of the water like that. Only if that pond that they're in dries up completely, um, would they have to seek uh, another waterway. But typically they stay in water that's a little deeper. You can find them in lakes, rivers, but also swamps and ponds. So it was probably in a pond that dried up and crossed in the street and it didn't work out so well. Um, on the neck here, this one doesn't have big ones, but they have these spikes right here on the neck. And you can see how docile they are when they're out of the water typically. Um, these little spikes here, those are sensors. They're highly developed sensors that our military actually has studied these. And what happens when he's in the water and uh, fish go by, you know, let's say it's a, a small school of fish, he'll open his mouth, which I'll show you in a minute, and he'll have this worm-like thing inside of his mouth that he wiggles around and the fish will think that it is, uh, uh, you know, a worm in a cave and swim right inside of his mouth. And if it, the water current moves a lot, then he would get scared and he would bury in the mud. Even though they can bite very hard, it is a very shy uh, animal. I want to pick up, this one cannot put his head in the shell. The snapping turtles we have here in, uh, in New England, their necks are much longer, could actually come and bite my hand right here, and much more aggressive. These guys, for the most part, when they're out of the water, are very docile like that. I just want to show you the bottom, all the fat that he has behind the back legs. Nice, healthy turtle. You want to see a turtle that has uh, some extra fat like that in these snapping turtles. There you go, and we'll see. This guy is really... Uh, easy going. Let me put him right here. Chris, don't let him jump off that table and uh, get you a little bottle of uh, water. Yeah, so that's a great question. So the uh, top part of the shell, the carapace, is, covers the whole entire body. And then the plastron on the snapping turtle, and that is true on all snapping turtles, is much, much smaller. So you can see there's a lot of room for the leg fat. 
Um, why that is, I uh, really don't know. Um, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of speculation, but really, we don't know for sure. You'll see they do shed uh, sloth a little bits of their skin, and uh, they're not a very fast walker at all. That's why you don't see them on land. But this guy, oh, one reason. And again, I, the, the information I have on these guys is secondhand because you know we take them in. But one, one thing I was told is that. Um, they thought that they could, he couldn't smell anymore through his damage to the sinus. But this guy here, uh, he can smell fine. And the neat thing about turtles is they can actually smell underwater. And um, my son Josh is 15 now. When he was five, I had to jump in the pool and grab him off the bottom of the pool. I got him out and got the water out. He was fine. And I said, Josh, what were you thinking, buddy? And he goes, oh, I was being a turtle and I was smelling underwater. And um, <laughs> Because he was a five-year-old boy who grew up, grows up in a zoo, and just thought if an animal can do it, I can do it. Um, so yeah, smelling underwater is not something that humans uh, were blessed with, but for a turtle, it's not a not a problem at all. But you can see his mouth is open now, and they eat a lot of fish, and they will um, they get their name alligator snapper because they do actually uh, bite legs off of alligators and have them reported eating alligators in Texas. I have some friends in Texas. My wife is from Texas. Uh, they have, they call them loggerhead turtles because they look like a big log uh, floating in the water. But, um, and you can see inside the mouth there, see how that looks like that little fleshy appendage right there? It's wiggling around. You get that, Chris? And uh, I can pick them up too. See how it's wiggling? So he's just wiggling because his mouth is open. If he was hunting, he knows he's not in the water, he's not hunting. If he was hunting, he'd actually pump blood into that and it would turn red and wiggle and look more attractive to a fish coming by. All right, let me show you what happens when I'm going to put them over here, Chris, when something goes into his mouth. Now, most things are made out of a high percentage of water, so we'll pretend this water bottle is a fish. And swimming by beaker here. There you go, buddy. Not my face. There you go. So you can see. Uh, you don't want that to be your finger because that would not feel good. All right, but I'm going to put you in your car seat and I'll put this water out here because it's leaking, of course. And that's the last turtle today, I promise. I know I definitely have a thing with turtles. Huh? I actually have a tattoo of a turtle on one of my teeth. I have a friend that owns a dental lab and he does tattoos on teeth. And I figure my teeth won't turn all old and wrinkly, so it's a safe bet to put a tattoo on, right? I'm going to move it over here. And, all right, let's talk a little bit of uh, conservation, and we'll do that again with another animal. But, hey, pirate. It's a little ferret named Pirate, and uh, Ferrets, the only Blackfoot ferret that, uh, the only ferret in the world that exists is the Blackfoot ferret, which is in the Midwest United States. And in a lot of uh, countries, conservation um, takes forever. Uh, they make forward steps, and it, like Africa will make some steps forward, and then they make, uh, you know, some, some back steps, you know. Uh, we talked about some of that last week. North America here, the United States makes um, some great, uh, some, some great conservation efforts and have permanent results. We're gonna talk about that later on with alligators and crocodiles, but right now I wanna talk about it a little bit with the ferret. So the Blackfoot ferret was a near extinction. Numbers were down, and this is in the last, you know, 15, 20 years, um, we're down to uh, just around 100. And that is the number where uh, the bloodlines become too weak um, and the species usually will not survive but we've done amazing jobs in this country putting on, on you know, certain restrictions on um, you know, poisons and hunting. And uh, there are, you know, hunting is very necessary for certain animals, but just making sure other wildlife doesn't get uh, injured uh, in the, uh, you know, get, get caught in the middle. For instance, the Blackfoot ferret eats prairie dogs and there are ways that people uh, round up thousands of prairie dogs and they had different techniques they were using that were detrimental to the ferret and now those techniques have, have changed. Uh, the Blackfoot ferret feeds on prairie dogs 
Uh, so we need to have a population of prairie dogs in the wild as well. So the blackfoot ferret looks very similar to this uh, domestic ferret, just uh, the blackfoot ferret can get much bigger. These guys here only weigh usually one to, you know, three and a half. If you have a four pound ferret, that's a pretty chubby ferret. Um, this one here is probably maybe two and a half, three pounds. And uh, the blackfoot ferret can hit 10 pounds. So uh, look very similar. Um, and they are the only wild ferret. There are polecats and weasels and minks and ermine and things like that. Um, but the only wild true ferret in the wild is the blackfoot ferret right here in the Midwest uh, United States. So pretty neat. All right, put this guy in. I will go in a small direction here. Just want to show a few things that we can see literally in our own backyard. This here is a beautiful little frog called a gray tree frog. I think got a little bit bigger than this and they can have like different coloration. Uh, this one has some nice beautiful yellow on the legs. And that can be distinctive with males and females. The males will often have brighter colors to attract the females, much like a bird. Not true with all species, but you know, it's fairly common. And right now he's kind of a dark gray. Uh, when he gets warmer, um, he'll turn actually a uh, lighter gray. And also we believe their colors can change um, with uh, feeling threatened or feeling like they want to breed or uh, things like that. So uh, with emotion, but it's not true that animals can just stick to a certain color and turn that color. So he can, he can turn different shades of gray, but I can't put them on green and have them turn green. And that's the same with like anoles and chameleons. They have uh, information in their uh, cells and they can turn into those colors, but it's not based on what color that they're on. But if you have a pool um, or some woods in your yard, these guys, uh, I have cousins that live in the city and they find them, you know, stuck to their porch. I have a pool and we find them all on the uh, edge. It's above ground pool. Um, on the outside of the pool because the chlorine would not be good for them. And uh, they're like stuck to the edge. And you can find them, you know, sitting in trees, stuck to your house. You'll hear they, um, they make, you know, little uh, calls. And, um, you know, I'm not good at imitating animal sounds, so I won't even, you know, hurt your ears with that. But they make, you know, very elaborate little sounds. You can look it up, you know, gray, frog, gray tree frog sounds, and you can actually play little videos. Yes, my life is that exciting. I do things like that sometimes. And uh, sometimes you can put it on your phone. I'll put the, a call on my phone. I'll go outside in my backyard and then the frogs will start calling back so I can get an idea about how many frogs are there. It's a great way to do research without disturbing a habitat is uh, using sounds, vocalizations. And so it's a gray tree frog. They can stick to pretty much anything and uh, really nice uh, little, little animals. This one here is part of our North American education uh, program. Uh, the state likes us to have some animals, local animals to talk to people about. That's why we have this little guy. Then we have someone brought to us that they found that has three legs. So we also have these frogs around here uh, that make little noises called spring peepers. I don't have one, uh, but they're literally like full grown the size of my thumbnail. They're pretty cute little frogs. So if you hear frog noises, most likely it's gray tree frogs and uh, spring peepers. Okay, put this little guy back. Now, this little guy, King Tut, is a California king snake, though not limited to California. Pretty much can find him uh, down the whole west coast of North America. So, um, you know, and they live in a variety of habitats. They are an animal that can be found at, like, I think over 6,000 feet in elevation, which is pretty neat. Um, and, you know, uh, dry, rocky areas are certainly very popular, almost savanna-like conditions, because uh, you can find them uh, in Mexico and, um, at, you know, Arizona and Oregon, different places that have some habitat, even California, obviously, um, have uh, habitats like that. But you can also find them in more rural areas. I have a brother that lives in California, and he's found uh, California king snakes in quite populated areas with bunches of houses and, um, you know, uh, small yards, and he's uh, 
found them out there. So they, they can survive uh, warmer temperatures is what they need. They could not survive here in New England uh, just because it gets too cold. Um, so a pretty nice snake. They only grow to be about six feet. You can see he's wrapping around my wrist. He's not trying to hurt me. He's just trying to stabilize it. Though this snake can climb, they're not known to be found up in trees. Uh, they can swim in water a little bit, but again, not really known to be found in water. Usually just, you know, drier, uh, warmer areas. And you'll find them under rocks and boards and in, you know, leaf litter and things like that, or just sunning themselves out. Snakes and the reptiles love to lay uh, on pavement or rocks because they get heated from the top and the bottom. So if they're laying uh, on a rock, the sun's coming down, warming their body from the top. But of course, now the rock is warm, so they're getting heat that way. And if they've just eaten a big meal, then that's crucial that they can digest their food. So they definitely have to warm their body. As with all snakes, they smell with their tongue. And um, you can see the tongue flicking out. They have a nose for breathing. Snakes can swallow things many times bigger than their own head. And this snake is referred to as a king snake because one of its favorite foods is indeed other snakes. So uh, king snakes have to live alone. Um, we had a, a story, a sad story a few years ago. I say a few, it could have been 20 years ago. I'm kind of bad with time. Where we had some of the next town over, they went to a pet store and they got a pet corn snake to keep their, um, they got a pet king snake to keep their corn snake, com uh, you know, um, give them some company. And um, the king snake ate their corn snake within like an hour of them, uh, the introduction. So they weren't, the lady called, she was totally freaking out. We went there, cause it was just down the street. The, her pet snake that she had for two or three years was hanging out of the king snake's malt still. And uh, there was nothing we could do except Say, hey, I hope you will uh, be happy with the king snake as a pet. So you don't have to ever worry about buying him a friend. Um, breeding king snakes can be tricky because sometimes one will eat the other. And matter of fact, with this snake here in particular, uh, two or three times in the few years that we've had him, we've had to break up a fight between his head and his tail. We've gone to clean him, and guess what? He's taking out his tongue, he's smelling his tail, and he's like, that smells quite delicious. And it's funny because their, their brain will send a message to their, to their tail when they're in danger and they'll rattle and shake their tail like uh, a rattlesnake to try to ward off a predator. So what happens is the head sends a message, message to the tail, they're being hunted. And the same little brain is getting a message saying, this food in the area because they're smelling it. So they'll sneak up on himself and his tail will be rattling. Uh, but the head wins because that these guys will actually eat rattlesnakes. So the head will bite the tail. And you can probably find videos of this, I'm sure, somewhere on YouTube now. Um, and uh, bite his own tail and then start to swallow his own body. I, pick, I picked up this snake where he's round, you know, like a circle. And he's got half his body uh, down his, you know, down his mouth. What we do in that circumstance, I mean, they would eventually probably spit themselves out. Uh, their teeth are hooked backwards so they can open their jaw wide and kind of wiggle back. Uh, but what we do is we fill up, uh, the two times I had to do with him is um, I fill up a sink with warm water and I submerge him in the water and then he can't breathe. So he spits himself out quickly. If he was, if, if his body was to stay in his stomach for two days, he'd start to liquefy his own body. So snakes are awesome, not known for their intelligence, but just for their beauty. And see this one's trying to go in my jacket here and get, get warm. Okay. One thing I always do like, do like to tell my audience, even though this is a small snake, it's not a great idea to put it on your neck. A small snake like this can still cut off your uh, oxygen and still, you know, uh, choke you. And also a small snake like this still has sharp teeth. And if it wasn't on your neck and turned and bite, bit you in the eye, you would probably lose that eye. Um, I've had several eye surgeries from a wire that stuck in my eye. And um, I'm always thinking about animals. So I remember during my surgery asking my eye doctor, um, they had to remove my lens because the bacteria on the wire and the wire was used to wrap around newspaper. And uh, I asked him, I said, uh, if I got you a steak tooth during one of my follow-ups, could you analyze the bacteria on that? And he said, sure. And he said the bacteria on the snake tooth that I brought him was um, too many times to calculate a greater than, uh, you know, the bacteria on the paper. So what that tells me, if you got bit in the eye by a snake, uh, it would pierce your lens, just the bacteria alone uh, that have to remove your lens. So uh, if not your eyes, so that would be a bummer. I don't give five-year-old little kids that information, but we're all in college, right? So we can handle that. All right. So cool snake though, California king snake. There's albinos in different colors and things, but this is like a standard handsome color, right? 
All right, cool. Let's move on. Let's go a little bigger now. Hey, Galero. What's up, girl? Good to you. Okay. Any questions or anything, Chris? All right. So we're going to keep going. Now this here, believe it or not, is a red fox. Now I know what you're thinking. That's not red. It's true. Uh, if you see a fox running around uh, New England here, and foxes have a huge uh, uh, range. You know, the red fox is found throughout North America. Um, you know, the, uh, Europe is there. There, you know, quite a range. Um, but if you look, uh, Canada, of course. If you look here. Um, you can see the white tip on the tail. So the red fox, whenever you see a fox that um, has, has the white tip like that, that will be a red fox. So we have gray foxes as well around here, but they kind of have like a black, blackish stripe on them and they do not have the, the tip. Gray foxes and red foxes do uh, interbreed, it's been done in captivity. And um, if you see that, the hybrid, uh, the fox will be, you know, not this kind of gray. This is called a pearl gray, and I'll explain that to you in a minute. Uh, more like, you know, a, just a, a common gray color, uh, almost like a rusty type gray usually, but though the colors can vary, but we'll always have the white tip. So you have naturally gray foxes and red foxes, and the hybrid is, this, is the silver fox. This one here is called the pearl fox, and uh, unfortunately, these guys will be, be part of the fur trade. So this fox uh, was, somebody had it, and they did not have a permit to, to have this fox, so we uh, got her. But um, they are, foxes are, uh, sadly, in my opinion, that's just my opinion, one of the animals that are still bred for fur only. Now, um, there are certain circumstances where certain furs for people, you know, in Canada that work on railways need to have lynx fur and things like that to keep their face from getting frostbite. But uh, typically, a fox, people wear fox, for fashion and uh, you can have your own opinion on that um, you know again some things I'm going to tell you are just facts and some things in my opinion and of course opinions uh, you know they say opinions are like noses everyone's got one they usually have a couple of holes in it right so uh, you can have a totally different opinion for me but my opinion is it's really sad to just kill an animal just for fur I just can't I, I understand if you're gonna freeze to death that's one thing um, but the, you know, the people in Hollywood that love to tell us how to live our life, they are the biggest consumer of uh, furs for beautiful animals such as uh, the fox and uh, lynxes, bobcats. Uh, we're going to actually see a bobcat at the end, the very last thing we have to go out to her exhibit because she's being a little fresh. Um, so this here is called a pearl fox and that's for the color that she is bred. And uh, luckily this little girl will never be um, anyone's coat or shawl or whatever else you call things that you wear with fur. Um, you know, but that is primarily why you see this color fox. Now, there is a lot of these foxes that are bred and end up in the pet trade, and those are usually surplus. Um, you know, when a color gets overpopulated in the fur trade, then the, the babies and the foxes have to go somewhere so they can be slaughtered or people can step up in the pet trade and, um, you know, breed the baby, breed them and have babies to educate people. Um, because, you know, like I said, it's, everyone has a different opinion, but just look at that cute little face. How could anybody want to kill a fox to make a fur coat, right? Makes absolutely no sense. Especially, you know, this day and age, literally there are fake furs that look the same, feel the same, they're low maintenance, they're a lot cheaper. So you can go with man-made stuff and you know what? No one's gonna know if they're not an expert. It's just like buying a diamond ring these days. You can buy a great diamond ring or you can buy a fake one. Not saying I've done that, but boy, it's tempting because they look so real, right? So that is a pearl fox, but because of the white tail, white tip in the tail, we know genetically she is a red fox. All right. Let's continue. Chris, you think we could um, put a little screecher up there? It helped me with, Chris is gonna help me with this next one. Up top is a handle. Yep. Okay. This right up here is fine. Oh, 
Okay, this little beauty is a Eastern screech owl. And they can vary, well, as the cat is not happy with the animal showing here today. Um, the owls can vary in, uh, in color. They can be a grayer to like a, a redder type color. And this little girl, uh, we have our federal bird of prey rescue permit. And so um, this little girl was injured and deemed non-releasable by a wildlife expert in uh, Martha's Vineyard. And uh, happens to be someone I know quite well probably one of the leading owl experts in the world. So if they say they're not, it's not releasable, uh, not releasable, uh, neurological problems, not flying st uh, straight, at, you know, long distances, uh, things like that. So usually a, a small owl like this will get injured uh, during a windstorm. It's pretty windy today. We had a big windstorm last week. And uh, that's typically when you have windstorms in the spring, and early summer, you'll get a lot of calls for baby owls being blown into buildings last year. There was a, about a week where our phone was ringing off the hook with local schools and found owls and everything. So um, that's probably what happened to this uh, little girl. Or she could have got, you know, dive bombed by um, a Cooper's hawk. Cooper's hawks are much bigger than these owls. And Cooper's hawks love to eat other birds. Absolutely their favorite food. They cannot control themselves. So could have been, you know, uh, bumped into there or, you know, just the wind taking her to a tree. But uh, they have a a pretty wide range. They can handle, you know, warmer and uh, colder temperatures. And this owl, um, ha you can should go online. They have this very distinct little screech that they make, um, and sometimes they'll make a cooing sound. But you can literally walk by uh, these owls. They're not in, they're not endangered. They're plentiful, and uh, they'll be blend into blend into a tree, camouflaged in. You'll never even know they're there. But beautiful little birds, they only uh, grow like six to maybe a little over nine inches. Uh, so maybe six to 10 inches would be safe to say. And they can weigh only, I believe, uh, on the light side, you know, four, four to eight ounces. So it's a pretty tiny. Uh, so this is pretty sure this is a little girl because no offense, but you're all of eight ounces. Okay, so well, she's probably, a, you know, a girl, the boys don't get quite as big, but you can see very beautiful um, little owl. Well, I have to keep her in here. She's not handleable. When we take in these wild uh, birds that are injured, um, when we don't get to uh, hold them and work with them, only when the veterinarian comes, will we restrain her and have him go through and check, you know, her wings, her eyes, her, her nose. Um, things like that. So right now she's just gonna stay in here for probably another month and then we will uh, build her a larger exhibit. But with when you're taking a bird that's injured or any animal, you don't wanna give them a giant space right away because it's just asking for trouble, asking for them to injure themselves. So uh, she'll be in here where we can monitor her food. She's eating really good, which is awesome. And um, you know, that's it, little screech owl. So if you're out hiking, Hear some strange little screeching noises. Uh, might be able to find one of these guys. Al, can you help me just lift her down? All right. And we'll do uh, one more animal in here, and then we'll finish up. Yeah, we'll do, actually, let's try to do two more. In here, I'll go quick. Um, we'll run to this one just for a minute, and then we'll. My goodness, girl. This here is Aquila. Wanted to do her for the last animal to put on the table because Aquila has quills because she is a North American porcupine. It's smart food. It's, you don't want smart food. I chose smart food because it's healthy. And if you don't like it, it's one of my favorites. I'll eat it. So I got myself some smart food for lunch. So Aquila is a North American porcupine. I know it's hard to see, but she has about uh, 30,000 uh, quills uh, all throughout here. And a quill is just a modified here. So um, let me shut this. I hear that noise from that filter. Um, a quill is a modified here. And 
these here, the longer ones, you would call triggers. So in the wild, or even here, if something touches these, they're sensitive. Not as sensitive as a whisker, but they are fairly sensitive. And something was sneaking up and touching these, and she got scared, she would back up, exposing all the quills. Oh, Chris, can you get the back here? If you can. There you go. All these quills, see that? And they actually have a little barb on the end. And I've had them stuck in me, and they sting a little bit. I had one, I had an itch in my leg, I didn't know what it was, and realized there was a quill worked into a tendon of my knee. So it was probably, I don't know, working with the porcupine somehow, because they have the barb, they kind of wiggle their way through. Went through my pants, into my knee, and into my tendon. Alex is over here making fun of me, because he's, he's like, I remember that. Yeah, and my friend luckily owns um, like a hair club for men, and um, is a surgeon, so I called him up, and when he was done laughing at me, he let me come into his office, and made everybody observe as he took this porcupine quill out of the tendon of my knee. So uh, they can get stuck in you, they can wiggle in, they can cause some irritation. Uh, they cannot throw their quills. That is just something that probably started with the old Looney Tunes cartoons or something. But what happens is they have the little barbs on the end. So if your dog or anything mess with the porcupine, the porcupine can swing the tail, they can back up and they stick into you. And the barb is very sharp and uh, narrow. So it goes under the skin quite easily then they pull away or the animal pulls away and all the barbs all the quills stay um, i had a dog that was a, a pit bull that we rescued a pit bull uh, a key to mix and it had a thing about porcupines and one time I had to take it to the vet and you know put her under and take out over four uh, over actually 500 quills me and my veterinarian together so uh, porcupines are neat. If you like to hike, it's, they're easy to track. If you go to a forest where there's a lot of pine and you see pine stripped away from maybe um, a foot or so off the ground or a foot or so off a branch, that's a porcupine most likely. They strip away the pine and they eat the soft sap and pine wood behind it. So uh, because they are rodents, they do have to have uh, blocks of wood and things to chew on. The wild, it's trees. We actually have a lot of pine out here, so we cut up trees and uh, you know uh, things like people drop off stuff for us and we put pine logs in that exhibit. So our porcupines can live anywhere from seven uh, up until over 20 years in rare cases. So um, pretty beautiful little animal. Right, Quill, you're very beautiful. And she's young, how old is she, Alex? That's it, she's just a, a little one. And uh, it is the second largest porcupine, the only the African porcupine. Uh, gets larger. These guys can grow. These girls are about 35 pounds. I'm saying she's there right now. And then um, the uh, African porcupines can grow about 60 pounds. We do have the African porcupines. Maybe like the last program we do, we'll do like highlights or something. We'll talk to you guys or talk to Chris, maybe pick out like some superstars of each continent or whatever. Uh, one more animal, real quick. And I just want to give a little. This is going to be. A little educational here for us. This is an American alligator, you know, found in Florida, Louisiana, in parts of Texas, Virginia, Carolinas, Georgia. Um, this is a little one they can grow. The girls six to 10 feet and a few hundred pounds. The boys usually, you know, eight to 14 feet. Um, usually a little small, but they can get that size. And uh, usually, you know, 600 pounds would be considered big. I worked with one personally, it was one of the animals that was assigned to me during school. And his name was Baby Huey, and he was 12 and a half feet long and 1,250 pounds. So they can get pretty big. Um, the alligator has the round nose, and the crocodile has the skinny, narrow nose. And I want to talk to you about alligators and crocodiles. Of course, in southern Florida is the only place where the alligator and crocodile exist um, in the world. So that's right here in the United States, which is pretty awesome. Now, when I was a kid, I was born in the 60s, um, and alligators were endangered and they made an awesome comeback. They were endangered because of their leather and eventually their meat, they were being uh, poached and hunted, um, you know, quite a bit. And so we passed regulations on, on uh, hunting and, you know, that kind of and really cracked down on poaching and the alligators made an amazing comeback. They were taking off the endangered species list in the mid eighties, I think it might've been like 1987. And uh, now there is so many alligators, we don't even know how many there are and they're actually hunting seasons where you can tag so many and hunt so many. There are also alligator farms where people farm them for leather 
and for meat. You can go to a lot of places now and buy alligator meat, which would be the tail. Um, and alligators, I don't like to see it, but very net. It's one of those things that we can't let our emotions get in the way of facts, which in the animal business is very easy to do. But one thing um, we can do at a little fox yelling. You want to hold her, Alex, for a minute? Alex will hold her because she can get very noisy. Um, so one thing. Um, is that alligators when they're farmed it's the only animal farmed where there's no waste the skull and uh these bones up top called osteoderms go to um go to gift shops the meat goes to restaurants the leather to the leather, leather industry the innards can go back it sounds gross to feed the other alligators uh so it, when you farm things like that um though it's tough to see it, it does take away the need for poaching uh, because you can buy alligator meat and leather products and everything legally cheaper than any poacher could ever sell it to. The other reason why the United States is successful is we're a capitalist country that generates its own income so we can afford to pay uh, wildlife, uh, you know, uh, people, rangers, environmental police, we can afford to pay all these people to uh, protect the protected property. When you go to the third world countries, uh, often they cannot afford to pay the, the rangers and things like that to protect the protected land. Um, so that is a big issue. So money uh, helps. Why would you do things illegally when you can make more money and not get arrested doing it legally, right? So that's what the United States has set up that kind of program where people can make a lot more money with benefits and all that uh, protecting the animals than you ever could poaching them. So that is a success story. The other thing I want to mention is, you know, being a, you know, if you're a wildlife biologist to go in that direction or a zoologist, you want to keep an open mind. Uh, in the early 70s, when they opened up the um, nuclear power plant in, in Southern Florida, which is known as Turkey Hill, came under all kinds of protests. But you know what? That nuclear power plant, um, the water, they used the, this canal to cool down the nuclear reactors and what nuclear, yeah, I can't say that word, reactors. And so what happens is that is the perfect breeding temperature for uh, crocodiles. So the American crocodile literally was saved by a, a nuclear power plant being installed and the habitat, it's uh, away from people. People don't like to go and swim and hang out at these places. So it's uh, the American crocodile is a very shy animal. And so it uh, likes to be, you know, uh, out of, away from people. So this uh, power plant has uh, done that. Now it wasn't done on purpose, uh, but they do have a, a wildlife biologist on the payroll there part-time, at least they did, and he keeps an eye on the numbers. And because this plant is, uh, the area is protected, the water temperature is perfect, they literally uh, say this power plant is the reason why the American crocodile has made such a drastic comeback. So uh, sometimes we think something's bad and you know what, it turns out to be good. So keep an open mind when you do your research because you never know uh, what turns out, what, you know, how things are going to turn out. We're going to take a walk outside to do one more animal. Alex, you have a key on you? All right, let's go outside. All right. You have a leash and everything? So Alex is going to go ahead of us and go into the bobcat exhibit. Um, oh, over here, real quick. Let's stop. So we saw the um, the pearl fox, which is the red fox. This here is Isaac. Hey, buddy. I have no treats for you. So he's shedding his fur. He lives outside, and he is a what a natural color red fox. They usually only live three uh, years or so, a little more in the wild. This is Sheba, who was a ranch fox, and she was also going to be uh, fur. And so these are both red foxes. He's the normal color. And then she is, um, would have been a, a fur coat, but we got her. Um, Isaac is 20 years old. So <laughs> still moving pretty good for an old man. And of course, with the change of season, they're all shedding right now. This is a temporary exhibit they're in right now because we are remodeling. We did not know that we we're gonna be, you know, have everything shut down and our income disappear. Um, but this exhibit here that the Bobcat is in is going to be um, you know, this is 30 something feet long, 37 feet, I think. So this is a beautiful state of the art exhibit and we're redoing once the money starts to come in. And thank you, UMass for hiring us because you're a big help. Um, then we'll be doing the whole uh, back here for the foxes and all our cats in these exhibits. We're gonna go into the Bobcat exhibit where Alex is gonna control 
eaten. Bobcats are really hard to work with. They're crazy, fast moving uh, animals, unpredictable cats. Like if you have a house cat, they can be very moody and unpredictable. We give her shelves, uh, different hiding areas, but she's peed in, so we'll have to empty that. Uh, then she has an area back here. When we clean her, she, they tell her to go in to her um, the little hiding area here with her blankets. She'll go in here, they lock her in there, then they can scrub everything down. And then we have an emergency exit door. Um, oh, it's locked, we can't get out. Um, locked from the outside. So this here is Eden. And bobcats are found, uh, they have quite a range. Um, I find them here in New England, all the way uh, just about in, into Canada, I believe. And bobcats and the Canada or Canadian lynx uh, will actually um, interbreed in the wild, so you'll have hybrids. And it's not good to have a cat up above. Uh, Alex has a pretty good grip on the leash because this is an area where they would pounce on uh, their prey. So if she gets mad at Alex or Chris or me right now, and bobcats' moods change quite quickly, she could literally pounce right on you. So when I work with them, I prefer to have them on the ground or lower and certainly not up that high. So once they're up that high like that, then you definitely don't want to have your back to her. She's only about 23 to 25 pounds. Bobcats can go up to 35 pounds, but you can see she, how athletic she is and she could easily jump from there about 10 uh, plus feet right on to, you know, in the wild could be a bunny, could be a bird, squirrel, chipmunk, uh, small deer even. They've been known to take down or in captivity onto one of our heads, which would not be good. She has a very strong bite, very sharp claws. Don't let her small size fool you. Uh, she'll be um, two June 6th, and um, bobcats are solitary animals. They do come together for breeding. Uh, we will not breed her, so she'll just uh, be, a, be uh, single her whole life, you know? Uh, and they can live, uh, you can get, bobcat can live in uh, the wild, you know, 10 plus years, but captivity, uh, 20 plus years. So I hope uh, you enjoyed the North American animals. Thanks so much. I hope the students go on and watch this, because if you watch this, you can email uh, questions and uh, just info at animaladventures.net. And, um, you know, we have merged the college website with that. So if you ever went on the Ed Lackwood era one before, just go on to info at animaladventures.net, email your questions, and we'll get to those. Uh, within 24 hours, we will have all your questions answered. Hopefully this uh, ban gets lifted soon and people can come and visit and, and come and contact and pet some of these animals that you've actually uh, watching now through this Zoom program. So thanks a lot, and we will see you next Wednesday, 12 o'clock.